The 1870s carriage gown is a 10-part project. A Victorian gown with period accessories shared on both video and in blog posts for you to follow and enjoy. Part 1, The Plan, is shared in the blog post linked in the description below and in a previous video. And welcome to Part 2 of the Carriage Gown Project, which I now call the Cupcake Gown, inspired by cupcakes which I baked and decorated and then very happily ate this past spring. It's time we turn this dream into a reality. Let's do this. Part two is an 1870 blouse waist created from truly Victorian pattern 401 from the pattern selection in the early bustle era, 1869 to 1876. In addition to being able to choose patterns from the same eras and know that they will work together and represent historical fashion, the sizing is unique and easily adapted for a beautiful fit. Although I've successfully used truly Victorian patterns in the past, I haven't made this pattern, and the first thing I will do is have a cup of tea and read the instructions thoroughly. Alexa, set timer for four minutes. My assistant, Alexa. Four minutes, starting now. I've purchased this pattern in a downloadable format, and the first page of the download is how to print and assemble your PDF pattern. You can print on your own printer or take it to a professional printer who will do the work for you. The instructions are easy to follow and my pattern fits together beautifully. A rough cut of the pattern pieces and I'm ready to choose my size. Page two of the pattern gives instructions for taking your measures and sizing your pattern. Truly Victorian patterns are designed to give you the proper fit for the fashion of the period and you may not use the same size pattern piece for back and front or even sleeves. Following these instructions seems a bit strange at first, but the instructions are good and they will guide you to finding the right pattern pieces for you on the size chart on page one. I will need a combination of size E and size F for my blouse waist. To make it easier when cutting my sizes from any multi-size pattern, I will circle my size and sometimes even follow the correct line with a red pen or a highlighter to make sure I cut correctly. That is another nice thing about downloadable patterns. I can print parts or all of a pattern again if necessary. When I was cutting the neck facing for view B, I had a question. I emailed the Truly Victorian designer and got an immediate response, which was so wonderful. There is also a Facebook group, Truly Victorian Pattern Sewists, where the pattern designer and others familiar with the patterns share experiences and finished designs. It is a very welcoming group, and new to experienced customers will find it helpful, inspirational, and fun. Time for chocolate. Step one is finished and all the pattern pieces are now cut to my size. No matter how many times I cut into a fabric, I'm always nervous. And I look at everything twice and three times. But this embroidered linen has a definite pattern and so I wanted to take advantage of that pattern and I aligned the front and back pattern pieces and the sleeve heads to best highlight the fabric pattern. All the pieces are cut, but I realize I haven't mentioned anything about pre-treating this fabric. Usually, I would pre-treat my fabric as I would clean the fabric after wearing. A sample machine washing of this linen taught me that the fabric had to be handled with care because of the embroidery and that the linen wrinkles easily. That means it will be hand washing and a steam iron to take care of the shrinkage and the wrinkles that I'll have later. And now I'm ready to mark my fabric. I used to struggle with pattern markings. I tried everything and have realized there is no one answer. 
So now I have these five tools that I use most often. The tailor's chalk is beautiful for darker fabrics, but needs to be kept sharpened with a knife to keep the line sharp. Roxanne's Quilter's Choice pencils also have to be kept sharpened, but work beautifully. The Clover chalk marker is wonderful with a wheel to distribute chalk along a crisp line. The two-sided purple and blue pen has a purple ink which will disappear within 30 minutes of being placed on a light fabric, and the blue ink is water-soluble and will disappear when dabbed or sprayed with water. A Frixion pen is erasable because the heat of erasing will make the ink disappear and it also works on fabric where an iron will cause it to disappear as well. Thread marking is an amazing technique and one I plan to adopt when my other supplies run out. No matter what you choose, test everything on your fabric before you begin. Trust me on this and don't ask why. For this light fabric, I chose the water-soluble blue ink. I pinned through the pattern and fabric where I needed marks and then marked where the pins pierced the fabric. I marked the positions of the sleeve ruffle on the upper sleeve and the gather lines on the sleeve head and the bodice fronts and the bodice back. And sew a gathering stitch to connect the dots, leaving a tail at both ends. Time to begin sewing, and in the pattern, sewing instructions begin on page three. The first sentence is that a one half inch seam allowance has been added to all pieces unless specified differently. Since my fabric has just a bit of see-through, I'm going to sew French seams for the side and shoulder seams. I test my French seam on a small bit of fabric before I begin. A French seam begins with sewing the wrong sides of the fabric together. Seems odd, I know, but yes, wrong sides. Since I need a one half inch seam, I'll make my first stitch line one quarter inch from the edge. Then the seam is trimmed close to the stitching, in this case to about one eighth inch. Now it's time to press. Honestly, I spend twice as much time at the ironing board as I do at the sewing machine. Pressing the seams during sewing makes a world of difference in the end result. For every seam, I will first press the stitching. This integrates the thread into the fabric. For the French seam, I will press this first seam to one side, then turn the fabric over and press again. Every seam gets three pressings. One to integrate the thread into the fabric, two to press the seam open, and three pressing on the other side of the fabric. Then the fabric is folded to enclose the raw edge and pressed. I know, more pressing, but it really makes such a difference. Another quarter inch seam is sewn, which encloses the first seam. This is why the first seam was trimmed to 1 8 inch to make sure it was fully encased when this seam was sewn. And again, you know it. Press the seam to integrate the thread, press the seam to one side, turn the fabric, and press again. And the result is a beautiful enclosed French seam, which can be used for all sheer fabrics. I often use this seam for many lighter weight fabrics just because it makes the inside of a garment just as strong and beautiful as the outside. This is the seam finish I use on both side seams and both shoulder seams. But this is also a good time to tell you about one of my favorite resources for sewing fundamentals. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. If you have never sewn a stitch in your life, never worked with a pattern, or just want a refresher on some technique, this is my go-to resource. It never leaves my sewing table. And this is the page that gives the fundamentals for sewing seams. With beautiful French seams, the body is a single piece. And of course, I can't resist pinning on the trim to see if my vision is coming true. I love it. In the pattern instructions, we completely skip page four, which is for view A, and we move to page five for view B. The pattern has instructions for a neck ruffle, which is sandwiched between the blouse fronts and the facing. But since I'm adding trim at the end, I'll skip right to the facing. 
The facing consists of two pieces for the front edges and a single piece for the back of the neck. The neck area pieces are a curve, and I find that the best way to have a matching curved line is to have the pattern edges meet at the point where the seam will be sewn. The seams are pressed, 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 and then the outside edge is pressed under one half inch. The inner edge of the facing is sewn to the bodice body. The seams are pressed, 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 and trimmed and notched to allow the curve to lie without tension. Then the facing is pinned to the bodice and top stitch in place along the outer edge of the facings. I used a zipper foot for the top stitching as it gives me a beautiful edge guide. The facing is finished. Because of the embroidery on the fabric, I've used a longer stitch length to allow the top stitching to blend with the embroidery stitches. And now this step is complete and it's time again for chocolate. Now to begin the most gorgeous part of this design, those flowing ruffled huge sleeves. While the fabric for the sleeve ruffle was still flat, I pressed the one half inch seam allowance on the top edge and the one inch hem allowance on the lower edge. The sleeve ruffle is sewn together along the side seam and pressed, pressed, pressed. The sleeve ruffle is to be hemmed at this point, which is a great idea considering the amount of fabric to be handled. I decide to hem the bodice body at the same time. My favorite hem is a blind stitch hem, and my favorite sewing reference, Sewing for Dummies, has a great instructional sketch. Here is the sketch, and here is a short video of the stitch. With the hemming done, the seam is sewn on the upper sleeve and pressed, and the gathering stitches are sewn on the sleeve ruffle, beginning and ending on either side of the seam with a single row of long machine stitches leaving long thread tails for pulling the gathers. And now the sleeves are ready to assemble. When I gather something as wide as this sleeve ruffle into something as small as this upper sleeve, I will mark the halfway and sometimes even the quarter points of both pieces. This will allow me to gauge if my gathering is fairly even. I will measure the width of half of the smaller piece and begin to gather half of the larger piece to that measure. I will pin the pieces together at the halfway marks, adjust the gathers, finish pinning, and tie off the gather threads in a figure eight over a pin 
to allow for adjustment later. Once I'm satisfied with the gathering of one half, I will pin it firmly to the marking on the upper sleeve and then repeat everything for the other half. Knowing that the gathers are in the correct position for seam placement since I marked the upper sleeve, I can sew directly over the gathers on the outside. The upper sleeve and ruffle are sewn wrong sides together and the seam raw edge is then encased when the upper sleeve is pulled through after sewing. Don't worry if this sounds confusing, the pattern has a great diagram and as you see the pieces, it really makes sense. The gathering for the upper edge is the same as the lower. I gather the upper edge of the ruffle one half at a time to the width of the upper sleeve where it will attach. I anchor the gathering threads with a figure eight over a pin and then pin the upper edge of the sleeve ruffle to the mark on the upper sleeve. Pin everything in place and then repeat for the other half. Then I stitched at the gathering line, which was a quarter inch from the top edge as directed by the pattern. This creates a really nice top edge for the shearing. And oh my heavens and stars, we have finished sleeves. I pinned them on the dress form onto the corset cover and I can see a really fun summer blouse being created from the combination of these two patterns. I'm happy. The gathering thread is sewn on the sleeve head where we marked it per the pattern instructions. Since the fabric is semi-sheer, I've decided to sew a French seam to attach the sleeves to the bodice following the same steps I used for the straight seams. The armhole of the bodice has a mark in the front lower corner where the sleeve seam will join the bodice. Once that placement is made, the rest of the placement of the sleeve is easy. Sleeves can be difficult at times, they have been called sleevels. But because of the slope of the sleeve for this bodice and the gathering line clearly marked on the pattern and the mark on the armhole corresponding to the seam, these sleeves are easy. From the initial pinned position at the sleeve seam, I then pin up to the gathering thread 
on both sides. Gently gather the sleeve head to fit the bodice and pin. For a half inch total seam, I'll sew a quarter inch from the edge, trim, press three times, turn, repin, sew another quarter inch, press again, and press the finished seam toward the sleeve. Did I mention how much I love the clean look of a French seam, both on the inside and the outside? And our bodice has sleeves. And of course, I'm still making sure I love the trim and the buttons. I'm never afraid to change anything in midstream. Aren't those sleeves incredible? This would be the place to create buttonholes according to the pattern, but I actually did them before I attached the sleeves just for the ease of manipulating the fabric. I use my machine. I'm able to make hand-sewn buttonholes, but I'm not very practiced, and my time was constrained. I think if ladies in the 1870s had had an automatic buttonhole attachment for their newly purchased sewing machine, they would certainly have used it. I marked where I wanted the buttonholes to be and sewed them, or rather the machine sewed them, and I just watched. I used to be so afraid of cutting open machine sewn buttonholes, but this little trick has saved me. I put a pin at the bar tack at the end of the buttonhole. Then I can easily use a seam ripper to open the buttonhole and the pin will stop the seam ripper from cutting the bar tack. Place the pin on the other end. Repeat with the seam ripper and the pin will stop the seam ripper. And a beautiful buttonhole, and the button slides through easily. With the sleeves attached to the bodice and the buttonholes marked, I can now mark the button placement, and I've sewn them on the bodice. I found these vintage beauties in a Facebook de-stash group. Construction items for historical costuming fabric, trims, books, and patterns. And I have enough for the front apron of the skirt, which is the next post and the video for part three. With the bodice finished and the buttonholes and buttons complete, I can do a final fitting to adjust the waist gathers on fronts and back. The marks are already on the fabric and I do a double gathering stitch between the marks. I adjust the gathers, anchor them with a figure eight around a pin, and then sew over both gathering lines. Finished back and finished front gathers. With the bodice sewn, it's time to remove all the water soluble marks. They can be sprayed with water 
or just stabbed with a dampened towel, and they just disappear. Uh Uh-oh, you've already had a glimpse of my finished trim. I wanted to mirror the trim at the neckline, so I pinned from the center back and forward and down both front edges. Yes, both front edges. I'll explain later. I attached the trim to the bodice first at the outer edge with a short stitch at the top and a longer stitch underneath. I stitched a second row at the other edge of the trim near the buttonholes. Oh no, darn camera. And with the trim sewn on, we have a finished bodice, and it is definitely time for tea and chocolate. I love those sleeves. I love this design and could see wearing it for more than historical costuming, which is a plus for me, as I have very little space for one-time-use clothes and a very tight budget for clothing in general. I mentioned that I added the trim down the front of both sides of the blouse. Why? so that it could be worn as a jacket. The pattern has an option for the longer tuck-in style I made here, or a shorter style with a waistband. The front cover also showed the tuck-in length with a belt. I doubled the size of the belt pattern and created another option for wearing. The end. That is all for part two of the 1870s carriage gown, 1870 bodice waist, except for a surprise. It was so much fun to think of ways to wear this historical design with current clothing that I pulled some things from my closet will make a fun video for you. That is right after I finished the video for this blouse waist. And here I am at the end. But if you stay to the very end, I've left a little surprise for you there as well. So... Until the next time, bye. So the belt will normally be worn with something a little more modern, and for that I'm going to want to change the location of the button. So here's a little cheat that I sometimes use. These are made by Dritz, and they're called button pins. And they come in several different sizes. These are for delicate, non-washable buttons. So what happens is you can take this button pin, and as you can see it, it doesn't have the edge here and it has a little bit of a dip so that you can put it into the back of your fabric like that, slide your button on, finish putting the pin through the fabric, 
close and then you move this pin so that that little dip is now right where that button would go. So it still has all that flexibility to be able to close just like it would have if it was going to have the thread. And you can take that off for washing, you can take it off for moving. It works really well if all of a sudden you've had a weight gain and you want to move your buttons a little bit. And I'm often, often not sewing on my buttons, especially if I'm going somewhere where I'm going to have a fun eating weekend. Enjoy the tip.